Hello and welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. Today we continue our study of Matthew chapter 8. This is part 2 of 2. In our previous study in Matthew chapter 8, we looked at the first half of the chapter, verses 1 through 15, and today we'll continue with the study of verses 16 through 34. Before we go any further, let's go ahead and read verses 16 through 34. That evening they brought him to many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds have the air of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, Gadar, Gadarenes, <laughs> I apologize again, Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tomb, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Jesus' day was not over when he healed Peter's mother-in-law in verse 14 and 15. Why did the crowd wait till evening? Remember, the healings that Jesus did up to this point had been done on the Sabbath day. And so the crowd had waited for the Sabbath to end. According to Jewish law of the time, the Sabbath ended when two stars shone in the sky. And to bear a sick person on a stretcher or to carry them in your arms violated Sabbath law. To say a, a word or two about demon possession, I want to read from Kenneth Chumley's commentary, page 156 and 157. Possessed with devils translates a Greek word that means demonization. Belief in demons and exorcism was widespread among the ancients, but true demon possession was a phenomenon limited almost exclusively to its New, Tef New Testament references. It is not mentioned in the Old Testament. It is not mentioned in the Apocrypha or the Jewish Mishnah. The Bible does not reveal the origin of demons, but many believe they were apostate angels. See 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude verse 6. Like angels, they were spirit beings, albeit unclean spirits. Chapter 10, verse 1. They recognized Jesus as the Son of God. We see that in verse 29. 
and they knew torment awaited them, as we see in verse 29 and also in chapter 25, verse 41, and could possess a man by dwelling in his body and controlling his behavior, as we see here in this passage, as well as chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, and chapter 17, verse 15. We know that more than one could occupy a host simultaneously, and possession often manifested itself as a physical uh, debility, such as dumbness in chapter 9, 32, blindness in 12, 22, epileptic seizures, Mark 9, 18, skeletal deformities, Luke 13, 11, and even insanity, as seen in John 10, 20. Or, on top of all these things, aberrant behavior, as we see here in this passage in Mark chapter 5. Though demons could overpower a man, they were powerless before Christ, and they were subject to his word. So Jesus had already used this day as a healing day. It was time to rest, but Jesus selflessly continued his work. This reminds me of how we need to work, and it reminds me of the hymn, We'll Work Until Jesus Comes. And I ask myself almost every day, am I working, waiting for Jesus to come? Am I working? I provided a link in the description below to the lyrics of that hymn. Now, I want to take a moment and talk about the Pentecostal view of Isaiah 53 and verse 4, because that's exactly what Matthew quoted here when he said, Jesus came to fulfill the words of Isaiah. So let me just read something else to you from Chumley. The Pentecostal view on this test is known as the healing in the atonement doctrine. It maintains Jesus died for our sicknesses as well as our sins and that believers should expect God to heal their body as well as their soul. Three considerations, however, argue against this view. First, believers in the New Testament were not always healed of sickness. In chapter 9, verse 2, Christ forgives a paralytic sins but the paralysis isn't healed until Christ performs a miracle in verses 6 through 7. You might also want to go take a look at 1 Timothy 5.23 and 2 Timothy 4.20. Second, many Pentecostals retain their physical ailments after their conversion. And third, though we are tempted to apply Isaiah 53.4 to the death of Jesus because it's found in the suffering servant passage of Isaiah 53, and you might want to see 1 Peter 2, 24, such an application at this point is contrary to Matthew's explanation. We should not, therefore, affirm that Christ died for our sicknesses as well as for our sins, that there is healing in the atonement, or that health is just as readily available to everybody as forgiveness. And Chumley quotes Stott from his book, The Cross of Christ, page 245. Jesus gives the summons to count the cost. Why did the Holy Spirit lead Matthew to insert this passage into his series on the miracles of Jesus? Well, one, perhaps Matthew was continuing his thought from the previous verse on Jesus as the suffering servant. Or, perhaps Matthew saw a miracle here, a scribe actually wishing to follow Jesus. For a scribe to give Jesus the title teacher was extraordinary. For him to wish to follow Jesus was even more extraordinary. The miracle of the impact of the personality of Jesus on men cannot be overlooked.
Can the personality of one person be strong enough to move another person to action? Instead of just talking about Jesus, maybe we should confront people with his personality and let his personality do the talking. But Jesus knows that those who stick with him will have counted the cost. Being swept up in a moment of emotion or carried away by the tide of mere feeling is not enough. Jesus needs followers that know what they're about, that know what they're doing. And so he pretty much poses these questions to everyone who would follow him. Number one, are we willing to take up our own cross? Matthew 10 and 38. Are we willing to put Christ above our family, Luke 14 and verse 26, and are we willing to help the needy, Matthew 19 and 21. Here's the problem with the enthusiasm. Enthusiasm that has not faced the facts will soon be dead ashes instead of a flame. And the way of Christ is not an easy way. His way always involves a cross. There's a hymn entitled, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. I suggest you look that hymn up and study those lyrics and make sure you honestly believe them before you find yourself singing them again. Let me pause for just a second and just answer this question. Why am I always talking about what hymn I'm reminded of? Hymn singing in the New Testament church is serious business. Paul the Apostle says we're to sing and make melody in our hearts, but he also says that we are singing to ourselves and to one another to teach ourselves and to teach one another. So to sit back and say, oh, well, that hymn sounds great. I love to hear so-and-so sing that hymn. We're missing the point of hymn singing when we look at it that way. Every time we sing a hymn, we have to examine ourselves and make sure we are telling the truth when we sing the words of that hymn. All right, so that's my little aside from the lesson, and let's get back to it. And let's talk about the tragedy of the unseen, unseized moment. Another man wanted to follow Jesus after he finished with his father's funeral, and Jesus seems to answer harshly at first glance. You should know that it, according to Genesis 50 and verse 5, the Jews were obligated to provide a decent burial for their parents. What does this saying mean? Let the dead bury their dead. Well, possibly Jesus was suggesting the man lead the burying to the undertakers. And perhaps this is based on Ezekiel 39, 15. I should have put a question mark after that because I'm not sure that it is. Is Jesus saying that even the living are dead in sin and need to get themselves right with God even if it means leaving a dead parent unburied? I'm not too fond of that, that idea, but I'm not saying that's not wrong. Number three, the meaning could be tied to the phrase, I must bury my father. In the East, this phrase often meant, I must fulfill all my obligations to my parents and relatives before I can leave home. So what the man was saying is, I cannot leave home until my father actually passes away. Regardless of which of these, or if there's some fourth one that I haven't come across in my studies, the man was putting off following Jesus until the dreaded someday. Jesus knew the man's heart. And if he was putting off following Jesus now, he never would follow. This is why we're calling this the tragedy of the unseized moment. How many times have we let a moment pass thinking we would see this door open again? 
and then that door remains slammed shut. It never reopens. However, it is possible that Jesus was insisting the man follow him now and leave his father's burial to others, namely non-believers. You might want to take a look at Luke 14, 26 and Matthew 10, 34 through 38 to see if you can come to this conclusion. Kenneth Chumley said this, Christ expects us to honor our parents and tend to their needs, but when doing so conflicts with his word, there should be no doubt about where our duty lies. And that is the bottom line. Jesus begins here to call himself the Son of Man. And let me get my Bible, because I, I want to go back to Daniel 7 and read verses 13 and 14 before we continue. So we're going to go to Daniel. Seven, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Every conservative commentator that I've read says that the Daniel passage is a messianic prophecy. And so this son of man, he comes as a son of man, leads us to believe that the phrase carries overtones of his humanity and undertones of his deity. And that it was a messianic title synonymous with the son of God that linked him to all mankind. See John chapter 12, 34 and John 5, 27. We do know that in Matthew's gospel alone, Jesus uses the phrase son of man 31 times to refer to himself. An interesting thing about this title, it is a title that has no nationalistic or political implications. And Tying it into the Daniel 7, 13, and 14 passage, it made him the ruler and judge of everyone, not just the physical Jews, and not just Gentiles, but Jew and Gentile alike. Although it was a relatively small body of water, the Sea of Galilee was known for its sudden and tempestuous storms. The, the lake was 13 miles by 8 miles. The storm described here is not uncommon on the Sea of Galilee, and the Greek word used to describe the wind here is actually the same word that they use for earthquake. Let me read something that Barclay got from Dr. W.M. Christie, who spent many years in Galilee, and he says that during these storms, the wind seemed to blow from all directions at the same time, for they rushed down the narrow gorges in the hills and strike the water at an angle. He tells of one occasion when a company of visitors were standing on the shore at Tiberias, and noting the glassy surface of the water and the smallness of the lake, they expressed doubts as to the possibility of such storms as those described in the Gospels. And then almost immediately the wind sprang up. In 20 minutes the sea was white with foam-crested waves. Great billows broke over the towers at the corners of the city walls, and the visitors were compelled to seek shelter from the blinding spray, though now 200 yards from the lakeside. In less than half an hour, the placid sunshine had turned into a raging storm. Christ awakens and does two things. He rebukes the disciples, and then he rebukes the storm itself. 
He calls the disciples cowards, and by the word coward, he means fearful. This was caused by their inadequate faith. Just before boarding the boat, Jesus said, let's go over to the other side. He didn't say, let's go to the middle of the lake and drown. Faith is not learned from a lecture. It is learned from life. We see that the storms ceased immediately with none of the residual wind and waves that usually follow along behind a storm. Let's talk about calm amidst the storm. Why doesn't Christ come down and do these signs today? What does this isolated wonder have to do with us? Well, the story is not really a confirmation that Jesus could control the weather. It's a confirmation that wherever Jesus is, the storms of life will be calmed. When he told the disciples, let's go, let's go over to the other side, they were going to go over to the other side. They were not going to go to the middle of the lake and be drowned. He can calm our sorrow. He can calm our unbridled passion, and he can calm our doubts. This makes me think of another hymn, and I know I'm on a thinking of hymn kick in these last few lessons, but it makes me think of the hymn, Peace Be Still. And I'll post a link to that in the description below to the lyrics. The Peace Be Still I'm thinking of, though, is the one that is sometimes called Master the Tempest is, rage, is Raging. I know there's another hymn called Peace Be Still that I'm not familiar with the lyrics. The universe of the New Testament Judea was haunted by demons. The ancient world believed that demons existed and could possess a man. In New Testament times, this was evidently so. Where did these demons come from? Well, they came from somewhere, and if we read Genesis 6, 1 through 8, it kind of leads us to believe that they came, of course, from Satan himself. You should know that the ancients ascribed all illnesses to these demons. Jesus would have to defeat these demons, and so we see that as we begin to conclude this chapter. The demon-possessed men were fierce. The spirits which possessed them were fearful and insolent. Jesus showed unusual courage in even speaking to these men. If you want to read a full account of this situation, you should pause the video and go read Mark chapter 5 verses 1 through 19. Did Jesus kill the pigs? The demons knew there would be a time of reckoning. The men wanted visible proof that the demons were gone. Did Jesus actually know the demons would enter the pigs? It's not totally clear from the passage. They ask, the demons asked to be, be sent into the pigs, and Jesus just said, go. But let's not think too long on the lives of these pigs, because the question is this, which is worth more, these men's souls or a herd of pigs? However, on this side of the lake, obviously, Pig herding was allowed because this was an area populated mostly by Gentiles because we know that Jews would not herd pigs. So the town found out what had happened to the pigs and they wanted Jesus to leave at once. But they also found out what had happened to these men, that these men were now cured and still they wanted Jesus to leave at once. This is human selfishness on display. What about us today?
Are we prone to resent others being helped if it reduces our own privileges? The sad thing is, some people are more comfortable with the demons they know than a power they cannot comprehend. Jesus will come back to this area on the east side of the Sea of Galilee in chapter 15 and verse 30. And his reception at that point in time will be dramatically different. If you can't wait until we get to chapter 15 and verse 30, I suggest you, at the conclusion of our video this morning, go ahead and go read the feeding of the 4,000 as recounted by Matthew. That brings us to the end of chapter 8. As our study of Matthew continues next time, we will begin Matthew chapter 9. Thank you for watching. Please give this video a like. Please subscribe to this channel. Please share these videos with your friends and church folk and, and others that you think could benefit from the study of, of Matthew's gospel. Really, to decide what we do as Christians today, we have to look into the Gospels to determine if we truly want to and are able to follow Jesus Christ and make him not only the Savior of the world, but our Savior as well. Until next time, may God bless.